Next question, it is about developing long will and uh, devoting to God. Um, yes, the, the question here is uh, that it is feels very strange uh, to uh, pray to a personalized form, which feels very odd. Um, it is also indeed not uh, not necessary. Um, what uh, what exists are powers, and um, these powers are in a way uh, neutral by nature. They just exist. They just move. They just are. Um, and it is possible for a person to work directly with this with this formless power. Um, because in a way your own uh, spirit in its enlightened state or your own soul in its enlightened state is higher than the power so it is possible for your yeah your essence to work with all these powers and to to control them and to manifest them uh, but to do this in a way you have to act out of the consciousness of your of your spirit of your soul and if you act out of the consciousness of your ego, then it will not be possible really to listen or to communicate with these powers. And it is exactly because most people are in a, in a state of consciousness which is controlled by their ego um, and not by their spirit, that they often have a struggle with lots of powers, with lots of energies, and trying how to work with them, trying to, to control them. Um, and it is because of, in a way, the forgetfulness which occurs when the spirit goes into the body and forms the ego, which even to a greater degree blocks the consciousness of the spirit, that we need uh, gods and goddesses to remind us of the power and to, in a way, um, teach us again how to work with it in our specific form. Because our spirit can work with it, but often the spirit has little experience in working with them in a human form. Because uh, war means something different to an ant or to a bee than it does to a human. So there's always a little bit of a translation depending on, uh, on what form you take. But if the consciousness of the spirit is high enough, um, or the incarnated consciousness is, is high enough, then... Um, all the other aspects are in a way inherently available or inherently controllable by the um, by the incarnated being and then there is no need for a god or a goddess but there is a need to uh, connect to that power because that power will, wants to manifest it wants to change the world it wants to work with you and often we bring these connections um, we have with these powers either in the a personalized form of a god or goddess or in the uh, uh, formless form of a power uh, with us, especially to work with them. Um, it's also interesting to note that also animals and plants also have gods and goddesses. So for them also there is a kind of an intermediate uh, being or stage uh, which manifests uh, the power which is cosmic on a local level. Um, so what you see is that many of the gods and goddesses, they come into existence in a way to serve uh, a specific race of beings. And these can be humans, but they can also be other beings. And um, these gods and goddesses are sometimes active in multiple solar systems, taking care of uh, several species of beings in these various solar systems. But sometimes they're also very localized. Um, also different uh, people tend to focus or use powers in a different way which leads to a different projection of what the power is like or should be like or what the goddess is or should be like. Uh, usually the gods and goddesses have very little um, interest in how people choose to view them or choose to see them. They just use the creations which are basically astral projections. So if I think that uh, the god of strength is a man with a beard who rides uh, yeah, um, on, a, on a chariot drawn by goats and throws a hammer which creates thunder and lightning, 
well, if I create such an image of the God of Strength, then the power or the God will use that image to communicate with me. And if I think of her as a woman riding a tiger, well, then that God or Goddess will, yeah, contact me in that form. Uh, so often the gods and goddesses don't really care very much about the images we humans create. Um, it is just that if we have a strong um, uh, relationship with the culture, then working with that image becomes very natural for us. And we, yeah, in a way, can read the symbolism very easily of what they're doing, how they're showing themselves. Do they have a black skin, do they have a white skin, a green skin, a blue skin? All these things can be very important symbols uh, when, you, when a god or a goddess presents themselves uh, to you. And it's kind of a, a language uh, to work with the, with the incarnated person. Um, what also is, uh, is interesting is um, that depending on the culture and therefore also the relationship within that culture with the power, um, it tends to limit very much the, the, the contact or the consciousness which can be transferred by working with that god or the goddess. Um, it can also be quite tricky because certain uh, cultures or more uh, in the Satanic Cosmos, more in the Lucifer Cosmos, or more in the Arimanic Cosmos. And if you have a certain nature, it is very important to find gods or goddesses who are in a way native to your own cosmos, rather than find ones which are culturally appropriate to you. Working with the power in a, um, in a depersonalized form uh, is also possible, but then we in a way have to uh, dehumanize ourselves um, because the powers are greater than our uh, our personality construct which we can uh, can generate. The working also with with the power in this depersonalized form is usually also working on a more essential level on a more um, immaterial level. So in general, if a person wants to work with the essence of the power, they are working really with the life path, with the, um, uh, or with the society, or with the species as a whole, or with the location as a whole. Usually if a person is working for more limited goals, like, okay, I want to have some guidance, or I want to help someone, um, it's, they, people tend not to go through the effort of really depersonalizing, going back to the power and repersonalizing. Because often it is uh, quite difficult to translate uh, the neutral position of the power into the desires of which are very temporal and very local and very focused. Uh, so this is a way in which uh, working with gods and goddesses, but also with saints um, who, for, who have a very similar function, uh, can help to work on a, on a personal level. But definitely if you want to work on a collective level, then uh, you need to work with the in a depersonalized manner. You cannot work on great collective issues while still yeah, seeing the God or being limited to seeing the God on a, on a personalized level. Uh, you can, you in a way have to realize that in a way the power manifests itself as a whole group of gods and goddesses in different solar systems and that in a way the power exists both as an abstract uh, formless power but also as crystallized into the different gods and goddesses. Yes, the question is about developing the long will. So one of the, the methods I, uh, I told about was indeed um, devoting yourself to a god or a goddess or some ideal or principle, joining an egregore. Um, and uh, the question is, um, if the soul is the perfect blueprint of the spirit's development in the eon, uh, is it possible to devote to your own spirit? Or would this be ineffective or misleading? or is any other higher or lighter consciousness suitable? Well, the problem is actually that it is too high, not that it is too low. Um, 
because in the in the same way as I um, in a way our our essence is higher than all the powers in the universe. It can use and connect with all the powers in the universe, but. Um, Therefore, there is no focus, there is no desire, there is no will, because everything is already available, everything is already existing. Um, and willpower is very much about discipline, about focus, about limitation. And it's in a way, um, you sacrifice part of the harmony, part of your freedom, uh, to gain power, to gain control, to gain experiences. Um, and this is kind of a, a strange process because uh, we feel that uh, spiritual development is a process of indeed gaining a higher perspective and gaining more freedom and less attachment and in that the long will is uh, counterintuitive um, but we have to understand that it is a cycle only by in a way having experiences experimenting and learning um, we can develop the wisdom and the, the skills to, uh, to go to higher states of consciousness, to create kind of meta-consciousness, higher meta-patterns meta which allow us to, uh, to grow into more complex beings, into more harmonized beings. And uh, developing the long will is basically saying that uh, you are going to focus yourself and stabilize yourself in a lower uh, realm for a while um, to really become a master of one aspect of, uh, of life or of existence and by working with the long will uh, it actually is possible to take that yeah that knowledge or that skill you build up through various incarnations and also into other solar systems. These are very deep skills, very deep knowledge which you get because it's also a very deep sacrifice which you make uh, by committing yourself. It's like a vow, uh, an oath that you will uh, do this until you become a master. And often to become a master takes a little bit over 20 incarnations in general, human incarnations. So this is kind of like the yeah, the level of commitment or investment you're talking about. Um, so unfortunately, um, yeah, your own spirit is, uh, um, is too high and the same is, is true also for uh, enlightened masters, enlightened spirits. Uh, who also are above all these powers. Um, but gods and goddesses are limited, so therefore they can function. Uh, you can also devote yourself uh, to an archetype. So the monk, the hero, the martyr, uh, the mother. Um, and by um, archetypes are in a way a mix between uh, a combination of powers. So devoting to an archetype is in a way more difficult, uh, more trying than working with just one, uh, one god or one goddess. And it's often also a lot more prone to failure. People who are in a way focused on one archetype or devote themselves to one archetype, uh, they often get lost in the complexity of fulfilling that role in so many different aspects, in so many different cultures, and often they lose their way. Um, so, yeah, in a way, the god or the goddess is, is simpler than the archetype. It is also possible to devote oneself to um, working with an egregore. And um, the egregore is in a way similar to the archetype, that it also works with various powers. Um, but because the egregore inherently has a lot of knowledge and experience and also already the transmutation of all this experience into a higher state of consciousness within itself, uh, there's a lot less risk of getting lost than working with the archetype, uh, which is just a collective consciousness instead of really uh, a focused collective consciousness, which is supported by a, a more solid structure, a more solid hierarchy of beings as is present within an egregore. 
so you can just pick an ideal, find the appropriate egregore, and if the egregore is old enough and well developed enough, um, that can also help you to develop this, uh, this long will and to stabilize you over various incarnations. Um, the working with the long will uh, in connection with uh, an egregore takes longer than working with just a god or a goddess because on the one hand uh, you're working with various powers and um, that makes it more complex so you need more time to learn. The other thing is that the egregore often has very specific needs. It needs you to do this or to do that or to take no incarnation or take a certain type of incarnation. So you're not only focused on working with the power, on discovering the power, on serving the power, but yeah, you often get distracted with helping other members of the egregore or fighting for the egregore against its enemies or other distractions. So in general, working with an egregore, uh, it's an investment of usually closer to 80 incarnations rather than the 20 it would take when you're working uh, with a god or goddess, because a god or goddess, in a way, essentially has no opposition. Um, it just has a purpose, it has a goal, uh, so you can move forward a lot more easily, uh, rather than get into a whole tug of war with all kinds of other powers who are trying to control the development of consciousness in a mix of light and dark. There was indeed uh, uh, a very interesting other option which is mentioned here. Um, it is to work with uh, an alien race. And that's yeah a very a very beautiful option I have to say. Um, because in a way an, an alien race, an alien culture uh, can be seen as in a way as an egregore. There are also a, a group who was working towards a specific goal and who has learned to master certain powers. Um, what we see in a way in, in humans is that we as, as humans have a very dim concept of what is our purpose as, uh, as human, as human beings, as incarnated beings. And uh, the individuals which are part of humanity are often not serving the whole or performing uh, the role which we should perform as a race. And this, in a way, disharmony, uh, disobedience is also reflected internally. We have a lot of internal fights, internal struggles. Um, we really uh, fight with ourselves, we hurt ourselves, we don't know ourselves. And the same is true within our collective consciousness. It's not a very helpful place. But the collective consciousness of uh, certain other uh, species, other races, is very different uh, from that. And um, compared to egregores, there is not so much of a fight or of a struggle because there is no opposition. The culture is more monolithic. It is a whole and the whole people want to be in a certain way. They are aware of their goal, of their purpose in the universe. And they carry it out rather than the tug of war we have here on, on our earth. Um, and therefore working with the collective consciousness of an alien race, I think it could be a very, very nice experience and it's probably also a very... Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it would immediately lead to the development of a, of a long will, um, because I don't have personal experience with that and I haven't seen any examples of that either. Um, I have seen it in, in a larger aspect of, uh, of cultures working together with an alien culture. And um, what I do notice there of the spirits who were deeply involved in this, in this process is that they move back and forth easily and they are very devoted to bringing the blessings of that culture to uh, the, the manifestation of that culture on our earth, on our planet and creating places of knowledge, places of initiation and in a way antennas for those um, higher impulses out of uh, yeah, this alien collective consciousness. 
Um, and in this case of the Pleiadians, I think it would work because the Pleiadians are uh, in a way uh, innovative people but besides being innovative they are, are a very uh, dedicated, very dutiful people um, and among their race there is a very strong remembrance of their previous forms and uh, so they tend to possess a long will quite naturally and I think they can aid us in developing it ourselves. Now there is the practical question of how to join with the Pleiadian collective consciousness. Hmm. Well, um, there are a, a number of, uh, numerous methods. Um, one of the less nice methods I will start with, not for you to follow, but just to illustrate. Um, so you can build a temple, and in this temple you can build uh, a ladder, like uh, similar to the golden ladder, but then not really reaching all the way to the absolute, but reaching specifically um, to that star. Uh, the Egyptians built such structures, but also in uh, Middle America, also such structures were built. Um, and often in the building of such a structure they uh, incorporated the energies of various levels of consciousness so that the person could step all the way from the beginning all the way to the top. So they used to bind the consciousnesses of uh, plants, stones, animals, uh, humans and uh, not of course just normal humans but often even great kings and high priests to yeah, develop a complete bridge into uh, this higher consciousness. So it is possible to build such a bridge, uh, but rather than building it, I think it would be easier to use an existing bridge, rather than sacrificing lots of humans and kings, queens and priests <laughs> to do so. Um, so it's quite an investment for a culture to do something like that, but I think it's no longer appropriate since we are a lot more in an individualized time where we don't build things for our entire culture anymore. Um, so another method to do it is to um, in a way allow um, to ask allowance from the solar spirits. So the solar spirits and the uh, uh, the egregore of uh, Orion, they're the gatekeepers a little bit to other solar systems. Um, so you could uh, go into a trance, leave your body, uh, united with the energy body of the Sun, and the Sun is in communication with all these other stars, then being one with the Sun, so you become really one with your own solar aspect, so you really have to use your heart in, uh, in getting out of your physical body and to get into the right energy level uh, because you can leave your, uh, uh, your physical body and end up in many different uh, energetic configurations but you really need to end up in a solar configuration and so once you've joined your energy body with the energy body of the Sun you can uh, request that you're taken uh, to Orion or to the egregore of Orion, which is kind of a central star, and from there you can be taken to the Pleiades. You can also go directly to the Pleiades, because we fortunately have a direct connection between our Sun and the Suns of the Pleiades. Um, so the detour is not necessary, but um, it can be that they would like you to do something, or they want to impose some limitations, or they want to have some checks on you, so this is kind of like the, uh, the customs office, you could say. Also not to bring the wrong energies there, uh, or to get in trouble. Um, and in the same way, um, uh, if you have been there once, you can also invite a spirit, or you can hope to find a spirit in, within the solar body, which is originating from that system. Um, so those are ways to, to get into contact. 
Um, but actually to become part of the collective consciousness is a little bit more difficult. Uh, because once your spirit is there in the Pleiades, it has to uh, manifest downward into one of their energetic bodies, in one of their configurations, and then upward again into their collective consciousness. So in a way you have to incarnate as a solar spirit, so you're no longer human, but you are a solar spirit who takes possession temporarily or permanently of one of the, their energy bodies, so you incarnate, if you will, as a Pleiadian, and then as a Pleiadian you raise your consciousness to become part of their collective consciousness. And out of this collective consciousness you can go back as a solar consciousness to your own physical body. So it is um, a little bit of a complex maneuver to do, um, but I think it's quite well doable. Uh, because the Pleiadians, are, their natural consciousness is already quite solar. They are a very conscious, very aware people. Um, so the change is not as big as it would be with the various other alien races. Um, I'm thinking what are other methods. Other methods are of course to, in a way, um, go up to your um, to your higher self, to your spirit, and to create another manifestation, so to create a new incarnation within the Pleiadian system. Uh, so you are at the, then at the same time living in the Pleiades as a Pleiadian and living as a human here on earth. And then to connect uh, uh, through your higher consciousness these two different lives, so that uh, experiences and knowledge can flow from one part of your being into another part of your being. This is not always allowed, uh, especially in our solar system because of karma, but if the Lords of Karma would give you permission this could also be an option. And I know for a fact that there are various people who live like that and bring knowledge to our solar system in that fashion. So that's another option to use. Given that, yeah, to do a ritual like this, it would be good to do it during the, um, the solar equinox, probably. Um, best would probably be the, the fall equinox, when your body is charged with the, with the solar, solar impulse. You can try to do it in the, in the spring equinox as well, but that's more difficult. Um, if you try it in a place which already is a solar temple, that should help. Um, because the solar impulse is there quite strong, so that helps you to at least unite with the sun. How to prepare for such a, um, such a journey? Um, well, uh, step one will basically be that uh, none of your other um, uh, planetary attachments, which in a way limit your energy body to the solar system, should stop you. So in a way you need to have a good relationship with all the other planetary aspects, so your whole personality needs to be um, uh, um, enough aware or enough controlled by your spirit, so you can escape this solar system. If there are still, in a way, lessons to be learned, or a lot of lessons to be learned in the solar system, it is impossible uh, to leave the solar system to, to get into touch with other things. So, in a way, you're stuck in a class, and unless you can pass the, the exit exam, you cannot move to the next class. This is how solar systems work. Not just our solar system, but pretty much every solar system. So generally the beings who, which move from one solar system to another are already on the top of the class or they've learned what there is to learn within that solar system. Um, there is of course a way to cheat. Um, there is a, 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 in a, way a goddess Paramrita, she is called, and she controls the space between the stars and between the planets. She is in a way the essence of the void, the essence of emptiness out of which everything is created. And by working with Paramrita um, you can also, in a way, um, dissolve yourself and uh, come back in another place. Um, so that's another technique to use. Um, 
it's a, lot, a little bit more uh, tricky because it's rather difficult to work with emptiness and to dissolve yourself and still have the focus, the self-remembrance and the willpower to re-manifest yourself. Um, so it's a little bit tricky and people can end up quite dazed and often dazed for weeks when they try to work with Paramrita energies without yeah, the proper initiation or the proper connection to, uh, to the goddess to guide them in this process of uh, yeah, creation and uh, destruction. Uh, it is also reflected of course in, in Brahma and um, in, uh, in Shiva. But Paramrita really is the goddess which combines the two in one. And I'll say thank you very much to Anika for your beautiful uh, uh, explanation about the uh, Paramita. Uh, and I'll just repeat it here. It is the perfection or completeness in Buddhism. Uh, Paramitas refers to the perfection and culmination of certain virtues. And these virtues are cultivated as a method of purification. So thank you very much for uh, that addition, uh, Ninka. And yes, so the, there is also a goddess, in a way, uh, who helps us to develop that, who helps us to, uh, to work with that. So very much akin to, uh, to Sophia in the Western system but quite different. Sophia is more um, you know, focused on, on control or understanding of the existing world, while in the Paramita is more about the, the, the transformation. Also in Western culture people tend to be a little bit afraid of the void or nothing or destruction or limbo. Um, but in a way it is just a natural state of the cosmos before creation. It is not something to be worried about or afraid about. But in Asiatic cultures this is accepted much more easily than in, uh, in modern Western culture. Um, it's, it can also be, it's also seen as the, the cosmic ocean uh, in, in which in a way on which the creator god floats and um, out of the dreams and the actions of the Creator God, the universe comes forward. Uh, so we're in a way all little fragments of the dreams of the Creator floating in the ocean of Paramrita. That's by going back into the ocean and coming out of it again. Um, yeah, we can bypass uh, lots of you know, blockages and restrictions. And the other way is of course in a way to, to follow the system of creation. Um, and to yeah, uh, gain such a state of harmony and balance uh, that we can pass all the guardians at the threshold and uh, move out. And um, very good meditations for this are in a way meditations where you invite all the fragments of your being uh, to come forward and to harmonize them. So. Harmonize all your chakras, harmonize your meridians, harmonize your social relationships with the world. Um, these are also very good uh, preparations and often essential preparations uh, to elevate your energy so it can become high enough to really join with the solar impulse. Because out of any conflict and of any yeah, friction, our vibration tends to become lower, more limited. Um, that could help to uh, to prepare. About uh, persons who travel through uh, different solar systems, um, I was wondering uh, if you would meet someone here on Earth who uh, is very good at that. Um, I refer to an experience that when I looked inside someone's eyes, I could see the whole universe completely star systems, etc. Is it something uh, referring to a solar traveler person or is it something completely different? Uh, do you know that experience? Uh, yes, it's also been, uh, uh, been described in, in, in various uh, uh, books actually, the experience of 
seeing other solar systems, other planets, or even the entire universe uh, in another person. Um, it is um, th th there are two aspects to it. Um, one of them is um, the the it can be a quality both of the person who sees, but also of the person who is seen. So this is not immediately uh, clear. Um, so if it is about the person uh, um, who is seen, um, uh, a person has, of course, uh, energies of all different levels. Um, but generally, uh, the more subtle energies are invisible to, uh, to other people. But um, in some people, the, uh, the subtle energies, they are very strong, they are very present. So that even though the other people are generally not sensitive enough to see them because of their radiance, uh, they can be seen. Uh, it is also possible that they can manifest this higher consciousness and lower it so that in a symbolic form uh, uh, it can be seen um, by people uh, observing them. Um, so if it is about the person who is seen, it usually tells something about either the person has a lot of energy on a high level uh, or they uh, have a very open connection to uh, a high level of energy or they have the ability to manifest that, uh, uh, that impulse which they are in a way bringing to the earth. So it can also be very much about the person who has a very strong mission. Um, if it is about the person who does the, uh, the seeing, um, it is uh, also said that of, of like, like people who reach a certain state of consciousness that they can see uh, the previous incarnations of all, uh, of all people and they can see even uh, the creator or the relationship with the creator every uh, person's soul has. Um, so this experience of, of uh, seeing uh, previous lives, previous incarnations or powers can also say something about you as the, as the perceiver. Um, generally for the, the person who does the perceiving, um, it indicates um, uh, a role where in, in which the, the essential relationship you have with that person is the relationship which is not with the person but with the, the God or the power or the principles which lie behind the person, which the person is just a reflection of. Um, so for instance if uh, uh, um, I would meet somebody and I would see the Pleiades uh, in that person, uh, that could mean that I have something to do with the Pleiades and therefore I recognize that person uh, because I want to work with this energy and they are representing that energy or manifesting the energy on, uh, on our planet. Um, so it can also be about the perceiver that it has uh, a message or a recognition sometimes of this is a person who is actually from the same background, from the same uh, star system as you yourself. Um, the, uh, what can also happen is that it is not so much a perception of the other person but an awakening of your own being. So it can be that the other person had incarnations in a, in a solar system or had dealings with a solar system in which you had incarnated before and that your memories from, that, uh, from those incarnations or your nature which is still, or energies which you have in your subconscious from that solar system are awakened by the presence of that person. And uh, rather than realizing that it is an inner power, uh, it is perceived as an outer power. Um, so you see, in a way, it's in the person who awakens it in, within you, rather than realizing that it is within you, that it is. 